in Florida, if you can't say the word gay or we can't read these books on our history or drag is no longer legal in states or cities or whatever, that is a, a form of censorship that's happening right now in the present. But then 10 years from now, it it results in the erasure and it results in the the lived experience that we don't as queer and trans people and many other populations in the white Western world um, don't have the privilege of continuity and coherence. From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. This week, At Liberty is coming to you live from the 2024 Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah where I traveled to host a live conversation featuring queer and trans storytellers discussing the reality of doing their work amidst an onslaught of bills targeting trans people nationwide and censoring their stories. From the moment my plane touched the ground in Utah, my experience at Sundance felt like a dizzying fever dream. I'll set the scene for you. A collection of the uber-wealthy and influential descended on a snow-laden ski town, pounding water and plunging into hot tubs to ease their altitude sickness, vacillating between being stuck in traffic and buzzing from activation to event to panel to film. Upon arrival, I found myself questioning the ability of such a lavish gathering to move the needle in the everyday life of queer and trans people. And then, the news hit. Now to state politics, the Utah House passes a bill that could prevent transgender people from using the public bathroom that aligns with the gender they identify with. The Utah State House passed HB 257, a bill that most offensively would criminalize trans adults for using the restroom, among imposing other restrictions. The state Senate could pass the bill as soon as next week. The distance I worried about suddenly shrunk. Our three panelists could be impacted by this bill, as they're trans. Our experience on the ground was mirroring exactly what is happening to everyday trans people across the country. Our panel became an act of defiance. In many ways, this dichotomy, a celebration of trans storytelling on the heels of yet another new attack, is unsurprising. It reflects what we're seeing nationwide as 22 states have banned gender-affirming care for trans minors, and already over 300 new anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced in 2024. We're fighting back in the legislatures and the courts, but this is also a fight in the public discourse, one that demands us to fight back in cultural organizing by owning our narratives and telling our stories because the queer and trans community will not be invisible. Accepting the award tonight as president and CEO of GLAAD, Sarah Sarah Kate Kate Ellis. Ellis. More people say they have seen a ghost than know a transgender person. When you don't know people, it's easy to demonize them. Visibility creates understanding and it opens doors It's life-saving. We know that so much of our success in the fight for LGBTQ rights rests on the work of artists who are telling powerful stories imbued with honesty, vulnerability, heart, and grace about what it means to be queer and trans. In this episode, you'll hear from a panel of folks who are doing exactly that. We're joined by actor, filmmaker, and multidisciplinary artist Leo Mechiel, who stars in the films Mutt and In the Summers, both of which have had Sundance premieres. Also, Jules Raskam, a filmmaker, artist, and educator who has directed several films, including Transparent, Against a Trans Narrative, and Desire Lines, which just premiered at Sundance this year. Last, but certainly not least, is our very own Jillian Brandstetter, who is a communication strategist at the ACLU's LGBT and HIV Project. Together, we spoke about the efforts threatening queer and trans storytelling, and how we persist in spite of them. Leo, Jules, Jillian, 
Welcome to Alt Liberty, and thank you so much for joining me. It's such an honor to be here with you at the 2024 Sundance Film Festival. Thanks for having me. It's so nice to be with you guys. We're so happy to be here celebrating queer storytelling, but there's still a real void in queer content. Our stories are seen as separate, and greenlighting them can also be seen as a generosity even. Racial justice activist Brittany Packnett Cunningham says that the void we notice is the one that we were born to fill which I love. And I'm interested when each of you decided to take on filling the void that you saw in queer content with your time and your talents and what that consideration was like for you. Because we all know that void filling can come at a cost. It's hard to be the first and it's hard to break through barriers. So Jules, I know that you originally, you have this very interesting history in which you originally wanted to be a painter and then sort of stumbled your way into working for Dyke TV and then leading Dyke TV, which doesn't feel like a stumble. That took you then into filmmaking, and I'm wondering what drew you from painting to TV to film, and if you can tell us a little bit about that first film, Transparent, and what gap you were trying to fill there. Yes, I always wanted to be a painter. I went to undergrad and was trained as a painter, um, and a long story short around that, I just I became sort of politicized uh, in college, uh, high school, college, and then started working with political organizing um, and I wanted to find a way to bring my political work into my artwork and I just couldn't reconcile that in painting somehow. I just felt like the paintings I was doing that were overtly political in some way were just didactic and I was like, this is not the space for me. And then yes, I stumbled in, I did sort of stumble into Dyke TV one day and got working with them and there, there's the TV show that no longer exists. Uh, for people who don't know, Dyke TV was this amazing radical um, nonprofit media arts organization started by ex members of the Lesbian Avengers. And we had a TV show that was syndicated nationally. It was amazing. And we would teach uh, LGBTQ folks like how to use video cameras and how to do production. And then they would make shows and represent themselves and our communities. And then we would put it on TV. And while I was there, I was like thinking about, I don't know, whatever, the gender binary. And I was thinking about what, and I was thinking about the fact that I was maybe going to want to access medical transition in some way at some point, but also maybe wanted to be a parent. And the thing that drives me to make all of my films is a curiosity or a question, like whether that's about myself or the world around me. And I make films to learn and then try to make films that bring people on that sort of process of learning. And so as I was asking myself these questions about transition and parenting, I was like, surely I'm not the only person to have thought, wondered this. And this was 2003. So the internet was, and finding people and things on the internet was still very hard. But I just, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm determined. I'm going to make a film about trans men who bore children. So trans men who were uh, gestational parents. And that was the sort of selfish, like, I need, I want to help, help answering this question. And who are the people that came before me that could help me with this? And there was the part around that where I was like, what is something that is so deeply gendered and tied to an essentialist notion? And that's like being pregnant, right? That is like the thing that makes you a woman. And I was like, well, okay, what happens then when men are having babies? And how do we talk about that? And, and what does that mean? And how does that disrupt these essentialist ideas? Um, so that was what brought me into making that film. And I just borrowed a camera from Dyke TV and borrowed a car and traveled around the country and made my first feature for $5,000. <laughs> I don't know if that's something to applaud. I made it for $5,000 because no one would give me money to make it. And that's what it costs to travel around the country for six weeks. But anyways, that, that Dyke TV, I will be forever indebted to them um, for helping me figure out how to do, how to merge my politics with my art. And to give you like that confidence and support, uh, that basis for you to launch off of, really. That's, it seems like that's what Dyke TV did. Uh, absolutely. Leo, I want to bring you in here. You started your professional career as a child, a Broadway actor as a child, and also as a salsa dancer. But you're now involved in arts and across various disciplines. As for your journey with filmmaking, I know that it started with your films Chaperone and Dysphoria. I think a lot of us know you at, in front of the camera, but can you tell us about finding yourself behind the camera and why you wanted to be behind the camera specifically? 
Sure, yeah. My first short film is a film called Dysphoria, and I made it in 2017, and it came out of, on the surface, a desire to create something that would give me an opportunity to act and to be seen acting, because there was a woman in New York who was sort of mentoring me uh, after I got out of college, helping me understand how to be a professional actor as an adult, because I did it as a kid and then stopped acting, went to school, sort of had a normal undergrad college life and then emerged feeling like I didn't really understand how the industry functioned or how I could fit within it. Um, and at the time I was still sort of presenting as a woman and using an old name and living a totally different life. And she was like, well, if you want representation or if you want casting directors to take a chance on you, they need to see you on camera, so you should maybe make something. And so I wrote this script based on a house that I had access to that was a completely empty mansion. And I was like, okay, how do I, what, what is the story that makes this empty mansion make sense? Because that space was gonna raise the production value of the entire thing. Yours was 5,000 in a feature, mine was 7,000 in a short. Um, and so we didn't have that much money and I had never made a film, I didn't go to film school. And so I developed a story that ended up being this portal for me to pilot out what it would mean to live authentically as myself. And only in retrospect do I understand that all of the works that I've engaged with over the course of my life have been spaces for me to pilot out, okay, can I test this first in the context of a film or a character that I'm playing, and does it feel good? Oh, actually, yes, that's who I am. Um, and so in Disworry the Short, I you know shot it going by Isabella, which was my previous name, and and then by the time we were making the credits, it was Leo and I was using they, them pronouns. And you know, in the film, there's this encounter between sort of the old version of self and the new version of self and there's this merging that happens. Um, and so that film allowed me to do that. And, and through making it, I started a creative collaboration with one of my best friends, Dulcinea, who's here. Um, she's fantastic writer, director, editor, so many other things. And when I brought her the footage from the film, I was completely, uh, other filmmakers might relate to this, I was heartbroken. I was like, this film is terrible, there's nothing in here, this footage is, like, what even happened? Because I got everyone to work on this film with me through Facebook, all strangers, 30 people on set, like, not even that many friends, like, just strangers from a Facebook group called, like, Women in Film. And I was like, I I'm making this thing, do you wanna be a part of it? And so I didn't have a support system on set, and so when I got this footage and I didn't understand what it could be, I gave it to Dulcine and she was like, Leo, it's just in the wrong order. And I was like, what do you mean? And then she delivered me a cut that was non-linear, but that captured the emotional heartbeat of what I was trying to communicate. And from that, my work as a filmmaker really emerged where I don't really come at filmmaking from the perspective of telling stories about trans or queer people. I come at filmmaking from the perspective of how to queer and trans the form of filmmaking. So if film, and you know, I'm in the history of so many other people who've come before us, and it's like if film is a time-based medium, and if it's like an image, a material image, how can we bring a sensuality and a queerness to the way the story unfolds um, to do the thing that I think trans people do all the time, which is we take our quote unquote, like finite material flesh and we transform within it and, and ask others to go along with us on that journey. And so how can we do that in film also? Uh, so yeah, as a filmmaker, that's kind of how I come at things. But as an actor, I, I just love working with other queer people and I'll do whatever they want me to do. If it's a coming of age story, fuck yeah, you know? Okay, I feel like we probably have a lot of queer people in the audience who are gonna hit you up after this. That's great, let's work together. What you said about queering as a verb, that really resonates with me. And Jillian, I'm wondering if that resonates with you, bringing you in here. Obviously, you're telling stories through a different medium. You're telling stories either at the ACLU or through probably the hardest medium, the news media. When you think about trans rights and trans inclusion, how do you think about helping us and helping the media tell better stories about us? Absolutely, I, I love that. Um, as a way of looking at storytelling and as a way of, I think, reor reorienting how these questions are usually asked. 
So one of the biggest barriers that we encounter, particularly when it comes to news media, um, is that I often find myself telling reporters and helping them report out these stories to consistently ask themselves, what about the trans people? Which seems silly that you would need to do that in stories about trans people, but invariably a story about our healthcare, a story about our rights, a story about the politics of our existence, uh, generated controversies over us, have a habit of drifting away from us and going to assumptions that we're challenging, right? And I think one of the hardest assumptions and the tension that I, I think I'm always working against is pushing against, you know, when stories are often told about trans people, they're often portraying trans existence as an impossibility, either constantly imbued by hardship or negativity or as fundamentally unworthy. And something that I think both your films do so well and that some of my favorite queer storytellers do is seek out the possibility of trans existence. What would it mean, right? I think when we look at the values that undergirds so much of the work that we do at the ACLU on behalf of uh, trans justice. Um, They're in pursuit of these values that I think are really universal, like the freedom to be yourself, like self-determination, like community and care. And I think that queering those values, which to me means looking at them through how they enable queer life, how they make queer life possible, as opposed to having to justify trans existence within those frames, is absolutely quite valuable. Jules and Leo's work are an exact representation of what Jillian's talking about. What struck me during our conversation was how their bodies of work are addressing subject matter that is treated as new and novel in addition to being also beautiful and artistic. But they might not actually be addressing new stories at all. They might only be new to me and you because of the consistent drumbeat of censorship and subsequently erasure of queer and trans stories and histories that predate any of the recent surge of attacks that we are seeing. In Jules's film that premiered at Sundance this year, Desire Lines, He weaves a fictional character's journey through LGBTQ archives to learn his own queer history and find his own identity with interviews with real trans men today. I asked Jules what he thought about censorship and erasure and how they related to his fictional character Ahmad's story and his work more broadly. Ahmad is is a character who doesn't understand that he can exist. Um, and because he comes to the, the U.S. and he's come here just after the revolution in Iran, and he starts passing not because he's trying to, but because his gender is being read through a particular cultural and racialized structure. Um, and he's being read as male, and he sort of goes with this, but he's being a- assimilated into white masculinity. And so the film I- is also him sort of working to disidentify with whiteness and understand and and desiring someone who looks like him and desiring himself in that way and understanding himself as desirable. And yeah, he has to sort of go to the archive and understand, oh, here's this person, Lou Sullivan, and all of these other people that came before me. You can be gay and trans and and those things can coexist. So the film is really wrestling with the ways in which we have been erased from histories and are currently this country is attempting to legislate us out of public existence, right? Which is part of what happens when you make it illegal to use the bathroom, right? So yeah, I think these things are really tied together. I agree. When we think about censorship, we think about the everyday ways that you're describing. For example, Leo in in Mutt, censorship is seen through the everyday ways we keep trans people from equality in society. In the film, your character, Afenia, A young trans man goes to the bank to cash a check from work, but the check is addressed to Fenya, not Fenya's legal name, so you're unable to cash it. And in in Dysphoria, which we talked about, the psychological thriller about coming out as trans to family, we see your character Jack literally be erased from family 
So I want to pose it to you, Leo. What is the difference between censorship and erasure to you? And how do you think about reflecting the stakes of each in your work? Yeah, I mean, I think that they have a relationship to each other that's temporal. It makes sense to me in sequence in that in the moment that we're in right now, we talked about how, okay, in Florida, if you can't say the word gay or we can't read these books on our history or drag is no longer legal in states or cities or whatever, that is a, a form of censorship that's happening right now in the present. But then 10 years from now, it it results in the erasure and it results in the, the, the lived experience that we don't as queer and trans people and many other populations in the white Western world um, don't have the privilege of continuity and coherence and an understanding of, oh, I come from this place as, you know, we see in Desire Lines, like I can research and get to know the people that already did all of this thinking so I don't have to, you know, like, and, and so to me, censorship and, and erasure are, are sort of inextricably linked, but it makes the most sense to me in sequence. And I think that as an artist, I will confront erasure because I'm confronting the lived experience of being in this body in this moment and it has already been erased. You know what I mean? Like we're not yet in a moment where we've had generations of queer and trans people who've been able to build on each other's stories with a real robust sort of like economically supported you know, system. Like, we're just, we're doing it DIY, but then it gets erased over time. There's another piece of this that to me feels related, which is the idea of legibility. Um, and that we, I don't know, anyone who's sort of marginalized and living under a context, under this idea about human rights, you have to make yourself into something or someone that is legible by those in power to even be seen to then be erased. And I think that is, it's incredibly violent, right? And obviously BIPOC folks are put in that position, all sorts of people who are outside of um, the dominant or mainstream, um, anyone in power, are, are you are often required to use language that's not your own language to be recognized. And so the other thing that happens is those of us who refuse to do that then are not even captured on the historical record. And that can be seen as its own kind of erasure or, and or it can be seen as a way of actually escaping the violence of the state. If they can't see you, they can't kill you. No, Alok, we were talking about this yesterday. Alok, who is a film here, I'm sure most of you know who they are. They're amazing. Activist, writer, poet, performer, etc. They were saying, they were educating me that in, it was only in 2016 that there was a legal definition of sex in order to then use that to weaponize it against trans people. And that before that, there was not this agreed upon term that is in, you know, writing in the legal system and it only came into existence so that they could then weaponize it against trans people. And so sort of this similar thing where it's like, okay, you become legible so that you can be prosecuted or oppressed or you remain invisible and then you lose out on the ability to engage in the marketplace. And it's like we see over and over again, only the populations that have access to resources are the ones who are able to sort of do things at a mass scale. Um, so yeah, you're kind of, it's like, where do you go? Yeah. Damned if you do, <laughs> damned if you don't. Yeah. I want to bring in Jillian here because this is something that we've actually discussed you know, I think it relates at some level to this question of, some say with increased visibility comes increased attacks. Some would claim that queer trans people have had increased visibility over the last, I don't know, decade. Jillian, what do you make of that assessment? And do you think it's accurate? Well, I think it's deeply related to this conversation, yes. And specifically because I think there's an interesting dynamic between Visibility and erasure when it comes to uh, trans men's experiences and trans women's experiences, particularly when it comes to the historical record. 
because there's this myth that's been told over the last decades that trans people were invisible to the culture. And then Laverne Cox appeared on Time Magazine and Dawn, this new Dawn. And of course, that's not true. Go ahead and watch any TV show that uh, was made before 2010, 2000, and you will find any infinite number of trans stories, but they're usually punchlines. They're usually jokes. They're usually ridicule or public humiliation, right? So when we see that this idea that increased visibility has inspired this backlash, it's not just a greater volume of visibility. I don't know that it even is a greater volume. I think what's actually happened is that one, thanks to the growth of social media and two, thanks to the hard work and organizing of trans people across creative industries, there is a, we have greater power to command authorship of those stories. And in trans culture, like passing is this enormously complex idea, right? And I think especially in like trans feminine culture, this idea and out of like drag and ballroom cultures of, of realness, right? And it's this idea that when you're capturing the aesthetics that power uses to oppress you, then you're turning it into a tool of defiance. And I think um, that is partially what the right wing uh, specifically finds so threatening, which is that if trans people are granted our own subjectivity and our own self-determination, because that is not just the aim of their censorship, of banning books, of you know, pressuring corporations to drop trans influencers and uh, uh, going after trans people online and the rest, but also the very nature of a bill like the one that was passed in the Utah State House yesterday is designed to deny us the freedom to be ourselves and to express ourselves through a death by a thousand cuts, by denying us our health care, by making schools less safe for us, by making communities less safe for us. Those are all geared towards, you know, reinstituting the same power structures that have denied trans people power to tell their own stories as long as there has been mass media. All of this is bringing up for me uh, another thread that we've all talked about, which, you know, I know you called it leg legibility, right? I think Jillian and I have discussed it as the the freedom to be absurd or the freedom to devolve into ridiculousness. Um, that in telling queer and trans stories, wouldn't it be great if they could be as silly, stupid, or outright dumb as other people's stories? Um, what comes to mind is we have discussed the movie Bottoms, the lesbian teen fight club <laughs> film. How... And I think this is a question for all, for all of you, especially, you know, Jules, in thinking about you making films and worrying about if you're making films that are legible, right? How do we break out of this? Can we break out of it? How do we narrow the gap between what other kinds of films get to be and what queer or trans films get to be? Yeah, I mean, it's something I think about a lot. And I think I make films always primarily for other trans people. That's my primary audience, always. And that's my North Star, I don't know, whatever, my compass. And I'm sure there are lots of trans people who don't like my work. And part of this is because it's always experimental. Like, I, I agree very much with Leo. For me, form and content are related. And to me, again, putting trans stories in a cis framework is violent. And it's just swapping out diversity for diversity's sake. So for me, a trans story is one that is complex, nuanced, and maybe doesn't make, make sense. I'm putting that in, in strong air quotes. So I would lean into what the scholar Jack Halberstam would say, like bewilderment is a strategy for trans um, liberation. Like, I don't want you to walk away from my film thinking you understand everything. Because understand thinking you understand everything, and people bring this expectation to documentary in particular, because we think documentaries are out to educate us. So if someone goes and watches a film about trans people, they think they're gonna walk out knowing what trans people are as if one film could do that. But that's how, that's how we relate to film, I think, especially documentary. And so I'm always trying to push against that. Like, you think you know what this is about, but you actually don't. And that is what I, what I want, because that pushes against this Western notion of mastery. A filmmaker that I really love, Trin Timin Ha, talks about speaking nearby. And I love that, because if we think about it spatially, it's not one where I'm standing in your place. I'm next to you. It's a space of affinity and alliance, and it allows us both to have our full autonomy and all our alterity, our otherness. 
right? You get to be other to me and other doesn't have to be bad. I actually have something to sort of uh, add to that uh, because where you ended was, you know, I'm allowed to be other and alongside you at the same time. And I think that something I'm curious about because I'm still an emerging artist in my career, so I don't actually know what's happening at the upper, upper, upper echelons of power and decision-making in Hollywood and media and whatever. But when you get there, will you tell us? Absolutely, I love transparency. Um, uh, Don't count on me to keep the secret. (laughs) So in in this construct of like otherness or diversity or representation, I itch against it because I feel that a lot of the smartest, most talented, and I can really only speak for the entertainment space, I can't speak for the media landscape generally, but so many trans, queer, non-white like people in Hollywood are being asked to talk about themselves in this way where they're like, I'm in this box, this is the thing I represent. And you know, even with bottoms, it's like, let's give the lesbians an opportunity to be funny and have a buddy comedy. And it's all about the fact that it's a lesbian buddy comedy, whereas Super Bad, it's brother film, is just, it's not like they said, oh, it's these two, I don't even know how to describe those two guys. They're just guys because they're the default, right? White cis men are the default. They don't need to be legible or described or identified. And so this dialectic of I have to sort of identify myself to exist in this construct I think comes from this paradigm in the US which makes people like oh this it's like how do I get there with you Um, it makes people feel like if I'm not trans this is a cause I have to care about to be a good person rather than separation Exactly. Yeah. This this mode of separation as the default, as the invisible organizing principle in our society socially that separates us at this like fundamental paradigm where it's like, oh, I'm going to be a compassionate, empathetic person and therefore care about this cause, not I'm going to become critical and question the ideology that that pushes separation at all. Who is benefiting from separation? Do you know what I mean? Like that paradigm at the core of it is the thing that I'm like, can we get some of these expert storytellers some serious resources and do like a think tank like mode where we're doing covert culture shifting to move people away from the paradigm of separation and into one of like collective resistance, you know? I think you have a real point there, Leo. I do. I think of it as this institutional covert censorship operation. I mean, even, no shade, but like there's a a plethora of queer films premiering at Sundance and they are labeled as such. And I sometimes worry that the separation and being branded as niche prevents the people who really need to be transformed by these stories from even engaging with them in the first place. And I also think about, you know, especially as we, you know, these stories are seeking funding to be distributed out of independent film spaces, right? Really great that a lot of independent films will touch on queer narratives, but how do we get that big box office money? I think it happens through the immense amount of work of all the organizers that are existing and came before us. But it, it, it's like, I feel like I see it happening very slowly. We have Good Grief on Netflix by Dan Levy, who's a gay man, really, I love him, huge fan. And, you know, it's not, it's not being marketed as a gay film about grief. It's being marketed as a film about grief. And that is because a white cis gay man is sort of at the top of the social hierarchy of queerness. And so then eventually that will trickle down to the point where Mutt, for example, doesn't have to be marketed as a trans coming of age story. It can be marketed as a coming of age story about a young person living in New York City, which many people can respond to. That being said, we're still in this paradigm of sort of like one thing at a time trying to get to the place where we get to good grief instead of going through the back door. You know what I mean? And I'm asking for shit that I can't provide, but I'm saying it. What is the back door? Yeah. The back door is the group of cultural thinkers who get together and understand how to 
do like mass marketing campaigns that change people's ideas about things and not the kindness billboard, which I love that, but it's more the, the period of time where drunk driving became really socially unacceptable because it was awkward if you were a drunk driver. They made it into something that had a social pariah feeling and they did that through strategic advertising at a mass scale and they changed people's emotion, women and smoking, like the, the burgeoning of neoliberalism, like their capacity to make smoking a sexy thing for women to do. And before that, women had never bought cigarettes. That was a man's thing. And now they can sell a ton of cigarettes. That kind of thinking, I'm like, we need to employ that. And I feel like many people probably are, but can more people be doing that? So I'm here to just say that in case anyone here has a lot of money or knows someone powerful, call them and get started. And I don't need to be a part of it, but like, I'm just saying that in case it catches somewhere. The ways in which trans stories, and queer stories more broadly, are forced to be legible, are separated and niched, and fail consistently to receive meaningful funding, are all forms of censorship that set the stage for the erasure of trans people themselves. We see this pattern in our work at the ACLU. As we wrapped up our conversation, I asked Jillian to remind our audience of the stakes trans people are facing today, and what we can all be doing to fight back? Well, one is, uh, pray for me personally, no, is uh, <laughs> the ACLU and our nationwide affiliate network uh, launched at least a dozen lawsuits over the past year challenging bans on uh, health care for transgender youth. And in the uh, challenges in Tennessee and Kentucky, we've appealed up to the Supreme Court to review. Um, we will hear back from the Supreme Court as to whether they will review it um, as soon as March. And in fact, I learned about a different scenario in our challenge to a ban in Idaho, um, where they could allow that law to either continue to be blocked, because we successfully blocked it in federal court, um, or allow it to take effect. Um, as soon as February. So all of this um, is marshalling right to the highest ranks of the government very fast. Um, frankly, we, we knew that it was headed there. One of the most encouraging things I've seen and, and, and a space that I've learned a lot from is abortion rights organizing and specifically organizing not just for abortion rights, but for abortion, like accessing it, self-managing it, um, getting abortion to people who need it. And in the United States, the number of abortions that were performed after the Supreme Court's Dobbs opinion overturning Roe v. Wade actually went up at a national scale. Of course, went down in states that banned it and then up in states that didn't. And that was the result of really decades of organizing, community building, building networks of support, of not waiting for other people to give you permission to do it. Um, I think that there has been through whatever, like, sort of philanthropic power has been invested into uh, the trans advocacy space um, over the last decade is very recent in comparison. Um, so we need to build a lot of power and we need to build it very fast. We need to build a lot of networks of care. We need to build it very fast. Right now, there are some more, I think, immediate calls to action. One of the first that comes to mind is right here in Utah, if you are a Utah resident, um, the ACLU of Utah has an action page up right on its website where you can go and tell the uh, Utah State Senate um, not to pass uh, this bill, which they'll have the form for you when you get there. Don't worry. Don't worry about the language. But this bill that would effectively criminalize trans people for using the bathroom and uh, there will be actions going around on iPads for you for any resident of the United States to tell Congress uh, to fight back against restrictions that are being proposed against gender affirming care, not just for trans youth, but for trans people of any age. Um, these are being championed first and foremost by Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene and are potentially part of the next budget deal. They've been potentially part of the next budget deal since like August, and we've successfully fought back so far, which is great, but we still need your help doing that. Amazing. Thank you. And, you know, at the ACLU, we know that oftentimes we fight first in the culture and we win first in the culture. The culture change helps us in our legal fights and our political advocacy fights. That's why we brought you here today. Jules, I'm going to let you have the last word. We have a bunch of industry people in the audience. What can they do to help us make culture change so that then we can make political and legal change? I'm just 
say this, try to say this as, as nicely as possible. Take more risks. Stop funding the same things that are supporting the narratives that are already out there that you already know and that are safe. You just have to take more risks and trust us that we know what, that what, how to tell the story in the way that it needs to be told in order to shift culture. Amazing. Amazing. Well, with that, thank you all so much for joining me today. It was so great to speak with you. I feel so excited about all the work that you're doing and all the work that you will do in the future. And Leo, once you get the keys to the kingdom, make sure you tell us all the secrets. As the panel concluded, the audience exited the theater and we came down from our performance adrenaline high. Our bodily reality set in. Jillian and I had to go to the bathroom. There we were, two blonde women, one cis and one trans, looking into the bathroom mirror, reckoning with the news of Utah's impending trans bathroom ban. In that moment, Jillian lit up with an idea. She saw an opportunity to illustrate the impact of the bathroom ban. I pulled out my phone and while in the women's restroom in Park City, Utah, at the Sundance Film Festival, we recorded a social video to get the word out about the new proposed ban and to rally our ACLU supporters to fight back. This is why sharing our stories matters. Thanks to Leo Mahiel, Jules Roskam, and Jillian Brandsnetter for joining us at the 2024 Sundance Film Festival. And thanks to you all for listening. If you appreciated this conversation, subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. If you want to join us at the ACLU of Utah in fighting back against the bathroom ban, sign the petition at the link in the description box of this episode. Until next week, stay strong. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, and Vanessa Handy. This episode was edited by Carrie Daniels.